Hi everybody, welcome to session 3.9 where we talk about managing assets for a nonprofit. For this class session, I want you to be able to describe how endowments are managed effectively, to explain the challenges of maintaining physical property, and to identify the different types of intellectual property that exist and how to protect them. So let's talk first about endowments. An endowment is essentially a large pool of invested assets. And so it's going to be things like uh, publicly traded stock. Uh, it could include real estate um, uh, bonds, uh, either municipal or corporate bonds. Essentially all the typical ways that people can invest their, their money. Um, an endowment is a large pool of these invested assets. In general, endowments are invested, or sorry, are managed by financial advisors. Um, and so the kind of jobs that you would see, uh, you know, where people are managing personal uh, investments for people or like a, for a mutual fund or something like that for retirement savings, those are the same professionals typically managing endowments. I just want to teach you some concepts that relate to endowments so you understand what people are talking about when these details come up. First of all, I want to talk about these terms principal or corpus. These two terms are generally interchangeable. And they, and they mostly refer to the gifted amount. So whatever was given into the endowment by the original donor, say you had a $10 million gift into an endowment, that $10 million of invested assets would be the corpus. And that's often restricted. The most common restriction is that the nonprofit isn't allowed to use up the corpus, meaning that it's protected and only the growth of the endowment is available for operations or other activities, but never the um, but never the corpus itself, meaning the original gift. Other restrictions can include how the funds how the how the investment growth is used, meaning that the donor could restrict the endowment to, uh, the endowment proceeds to be used for other kinds of activities. What happens with this endowment over time is hopefully the invested assets in the endowment grow. And as they grow, it creates the opportunity for what's called a distribution or sometimes called income from the endowment. And this is where profit from the invested assets is then distributed to the nonprofit for operations, or the profit might be reinvested into the corpus, or both of those things could happen where part of the profit goes to the, goes to the organization for its operations, and then the remainder is reinvested. A lot of nonprofits will try to reinvest the growth of the endowment over time. The, the, by reinvesting, it means that they get larger payouts over time later. And so most nonprofits that benefit from an endowment typically don't try to skim all of the profit year after year. They typically try to reinvest a, a chunk of the profit so that the endowment corpus can continue to grow. Um, just some other tips that relate to the way an endowment is managed. The board is generally the organization or the group that decides how much of the income goes to operations. And they do that typically with advice from financial managers. And the board has a lot of freedom to do that, but always subject to the restrictions by the original donor. So however the endowment has been restricted, the board has to respect that. Otherwise, they've broken a contract and potentially broken the law. But, um, but within those restrictions, the board gets to decide. This happens a lot at BYU. Where the where the board of the board of trustees for BYU will look at the investment returns on the endowments that fund things like scholarships or professorships or other things going on here, and then the board decides how much to pay out to the university for its operations, and how much of the endowment profit needs to be reinvested. When there is a payout from an endowment, it's usually based on multi-year averages of performance instead of a single year. And that's because from one year to the next, there can be a wide range of performance. And so it's pretty typical for when an endowment payout to ha th that happens, it's based on a five-year running average or a three-year running average or something like that, where the growth of the endowment is averaged across the past three or five years. And that's how the payout is calculated rather than just being paid out based on how it performed in the last year. And the term underwater, which is more relevant now than ever probably, is pretty loosely used, but generally it means an endowment that fell below its original value or some other benchmark. So an underwater endowment is one that has shrunk below a certain threshold. And if it is classified as underwater, it means it's not going to pay out anything. 
And so uh, the, in the 2008 financial crisis, a bunch of BYU's endowments were classified as underwater. It wasn't based on the original value in the case of most of those endowments, but instead on a benchmark value that uh, the church was using. And because they classified those endowments as underwater, the endowments did not pay out to the operations, which created a budget crunch for a lot of entities around campus. But the reason that this concept exists is to prevent endowments from shrinking in a way that hamstrings the organization going forward. The general idea is that it's better to it's better to be frugal in a year or two so the endowment has an opportunity to recover than it is to spend out of an underwater endowment and then have permanently less in the years going forward. So that's why this concept exists. Okay, those are really just the basics I wanted to cover with endowments. The reality is that endowments are typically managed by financial professionals, and so the best advice is to hire good ones. Okay, uh, let's talk about managing physical property. And by this, I mean things like real estate, inventory, office supplies, all that kind of stuff. Um, the heart of physical property management is risk management. Um, the thing that's most important about managing property is avoiding a loss of the property itself and avoiding injury or harm to other people who might be using the physical property. And so I'm going to walk through some questions you should be asking when it comes to the way your physical property is managed. First and foremost, above all, are people safe? Um, it's important that you maintain your property, especially your real estate, in a way that people aren't going to be injured. Most national organizations have safety guidelines for their chapters. That's true for the Boys and Girls Club, for example. And so if you're looking for good guidelines on how to maintain safety for your physical property, you can turn to the guidelines that are put out by United Way, Boys and Girls Clubs, and so forth. Another question to ask is if the property is well maintained. Property maintenance is a skilled profession. The people who do this, like for the church, for example, are people who have developed a pretty unique and important skill set. And it's critical for organizations that have a lot of physical property that they have professionals who help them manage it. So the best advice I can give you when it comes to managing physical property is to find help. Um, don't try to just do it by spitballing or guessing or, or deciding that you'll get around to it when you have time. But rather get a skilled professional who can help you maintain your property effectively and safely. Plus, if it's well maintained, you can preserve its value for longer. Is your property insured? You want to insure not only against the losses of the property itself, meaning that if you know your building burned down, are you going to have the funds to replace it, but also against claims that result from an injury. So if somebody got hurt while they were on your property, then the insurance can cover the claim against you. And so when it comes to making sure that your property is well insured, the answer obviously is just talk to an insurance company. Most insurance companies are going to be able to handle this or at least refer you to someone who can. Are you complying with the law? There are a lot of laws surrounding property management um, because of the risks involved. And so there are zoning laws that affect what you can do with your real estate. For example, there are OSHA laws that limit you on issues of safety, especially with office equipment and things like that. Um, look into the regulations on this. Get help from a lawyer who can advise you to make sure you are in compliance with all the relevant laws. The business licensing process will also guide you somewhat through that. Um, for example, when you uh, apply for a business license, if it's a place where people come and go, and 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 not like a business from home, but like a but like the equivalent of a retail location, you'll actually get an inspection done by a, by a fire department inspector who will make sure that the property is safe, and they'll they'll guide you through the process of making sure that your property follows all um, fire code laws. And then finally, are you keeping track? It's kind of shocking how often a nonprofit can totally lose track of its physical property and not know what's happening with it. There are software systems that you can find. There are even like basic things like Excel templates for managing property or tracking property. Property tracking systems help you make sure the right people have access. They help you keep it well maintained and they make sure that you do your accounting properly. For example, tracking depreciation over time. And so these are important details that you get in a well-done property tracking system. So I recommend that you find something that's easy to maintain, but that helps you stay on top of the details. So remember, this all just boils down to risk management, making sure that you're managing all the risks of physical property effectively. So let's move on now to talk about intellectual property. 
Intellectual property is a property that's created, um, that's found rather in ideas or words or names or inventions. Um, it's not property that's physically tangible, but it still has a pretty robust economic value. And so there are four different kinds of intellectual property that I want to talk about. One is what's called a trade secret. And this is anytime you have a process method or plan or formula or some other information that's unique to your organization. In the case of a nonprofit, probably the most obvious and important example of a trade secret is your list of donors. Knowing how much they gave, their contact information, the nature of your relationship with them, every nonprofit should protect that as a trade secret. What's critical with trade secrets is that you actually keep them secret. It's your job as the owner of the trade secret to do take reasonable steps to make sure that it's protected. And so if you're going to protect your trade secret, which then gives you legal teeth to go after other people if they sneak into your office, if they crack your systems, or if you have an employee running off with your donor list, any of those sorts of things. If you do some basics, then uh, some basic things, then you'll be able to have uh, a legal claim against those people for violating your trade secrets. Um, one is to make sure you have everybody who gets access to those trade secrets sign non-disclosure agreements so that they are forbidden by law from misusing your trade secrets. Make sure you have internal controls in place. That means having locked file cabinets, password-protected files, that sort of thing. And then you actually have to sue. If, you, if, if somebody violates your trade secrets and you decide to let them off the hook because you're being nice, and then the next person comes along and violates the same trade secret, you won't be able to protect it anymore. Once a trade secret has been made public through means that have not been challenged by the owner, then th that public information is now public and is no longer protected as a trade secret. And so you have to make sure that you're always staying on top of, of issues where your trade secrets are being violated in a legal sense, because if you don't, you'll lose protection of them. I think probably the most famous example of a trade secret is the recipe to Coca-Cola. And according to legend, only two people know the actual recipe and they never even fly on the same airplane together. And the, the heart of this concept is that they are very jealously guarding the recipe to Coca-Cola. And the reason they protect it as a trade secret is because the other ways they might protect it, like a copyright or a patent, would eventually expire. And so then everybody can make the exact recipe for Coca-Cola. Trade secrets are one of the categories of intellectual property that never have an expiration date. Okay, let's talk about copyright next. A copyright is any time you express something in a fixed medium. And so uh, that would be typing an email, uh, writing something on a piece of paper, painting a painting, recording a song. Um, any time you take some sort of human expression like that and you affix it in some sort of medium, uh, meaning it's not just bouncing around in your head, but it's actually in a place that's recorded somewhere, that creates a copyright. Uh, you probably have a lot of questions about copyright. There are a lot of misconceptions about copyright. Um, you don't have to register, for example, to have a protected copyright. Registering your copyright just gives you added uh, sort of legal oomph if you have to sue over something. Um, but, uh, but the basic idea is uh, that anytime you have a fixed expression like this, nonprofits will have copyright in the form of any like training or, or educational materials they might produce. Um, if they produce any artwork, um, if they produce music, um, all of these things are things that are protected by copyright. Copyright does eventually expire, but it depends on when it was produced because the law around copyright is really complicated. There have been a lot of copyright extensions over time uh, passed by Congress. Um, but, uh, but these are the basic ideas of copyright. Just like with trade secrets, if you don't sue somebody for violating your copyright, then you lose that copyright protection and it goes into something called the public domain. Now, we'll talk more about copyright because it's easier if I just get a chance to answer the questions you might have about it, but that's the general concept. Okay, a patent is different than copyright or trade secrets because this is where you are inventing a recipe, a process, um, an object, or something else, a design, and you're telling the whole world what it was that you invented. And you do that by registering your patent with the, with the U.S. Patent Trademark Office. And when you register your patent and the patent is granted, you've basically just told the world all about your cool invention and the details behind it. But in exchange for telling the world about it, you get uh, basically a, a monopoly over it for a short period of time. 
And that could be anywhere from a handful of years to even up to a couple decades, depending on how the patent law applies to your invention. Patents are designed to further human knowledge, but incentivizing the people who do that to, by giving them a limited monopoly over it. Once you're granted a patent, nobody else can produce that thing unless they pay you a license fee that you have negotiated with them. And so you see patents used in all kinds of industries. Nonprofits may use and want to protect patents if it's relevant to technology that they are actively deploying and as a part of their mission. For example, there's a, there is a, um, a BYU team that designed a merry-go-round that generates electricity to produce lighting for kids who live in rural areas without access to electricity. And this is a group called Empower Playgrounds. Well, the, the intellectual property, the patent, the, the, the sort of invention of this, of this device led to a patent that's, that's owned by Empower Playgrounds. And Empower Playgrounds can license that patent out to anybody however they want to. But the point is, is that somebody else can't just come along and do it themselves without um, Empower Playgrounds having a claim against them. Again, I'll answer more questions you have in class but uh, the other thing i want to say about patents is like trademark and, or sorry like copyright and trade secrets if you don't protect your patent by suing other people uh, you will lose the right to protect it and then the last one is trademark and trademark gets confused with copyright all the time um, and uh, trademark is is about brands uh, not about expressions like copyright is trademark is where Basically, specific words or symbols are being used to indicate the source of a product or service. And so if you look at, I mean, if you have a, a product nearby, like somewhere handy, uh, if you look at it, like I've got a box here of uh, Wrigley's Extra Long Lasting uh, Polar Ice Sugar-Free Gum. Well, Wrigley's, the company, has has trademarked the term extra. And ex as nobody else in the United States is allowed to sell, sell gum called extra without obtaining a trademark first, or sorry, without licensing it from, because Wrigley's has gotten exclusive use of the word extra. And the way you know that, and you guys have seen this before, is on the package, there's a little R with a circle around it next to the brand name. And that means that they've registered that trademark with the US Patent Trademark Office. The other thing you might see is a little TM. That means they're claiming a trademark in it, but they have not registered it with the Patent Trademark Office. Both can be protected, but a registered trademark is easier to protect. A nonprofit would want to register its brand name. For example, the Red Cross has trademarked Red Cross. And what that means is I can't start a nonprofit called the Red Cross and go door to door raising money for it. The reason trademark law exists is because there are obvious ways where consumers would get confused. By, by somebody using the same name. And so trademarks exist in the interest of consumer protection. But they also exist because investing in a trademark, if investing in a brand name takes a lot of time and money, and we don't want that to be squandered. Trademarks are good for up to five years, but you can renew them indefinitely, meaning you could keep a trademark active for centuries, as long as the law doesn't change. Because, um, this is, uh, because as long as you continue to be the source of that product or service, and that name indicates the source of the product or service that you're providing, then you can keep that trademark registration going forever. Um, again, it'll be easiest if I can just answer any, any questions you might have about how trademarks work. Um, and again, if you don't protect your trademark, you lose it. Uh, this is a constant battle for Xerox, for example, because people talk about photocopies as Xeroxes. Uh, the same is true of Kleenexes, Frisbees. Uh, these are examples of brand names that have gone into common usage to become what are called what's called generic and so the owners of these brand names of these trademarks are constantly trying to stop the public from calling every flying disc a frisbee for example or every tissue a kleenex okay um we'll talk about these questions when we uh, meet but you know is it really fitting with the idea of a public trust to give exclusive intellectual property to nonprofits? And uh, we'll talk about some other examples of nonprofit trade secrets besides uh, donor lists. And we'll talk about all of, the, all of these examples, actually, when it relates to nonprofits. So anyway, that's this class session. I look forward to seeing you all next time.